What if organizations owned their responsibility to create workplaces that enhance our lives? I believe that we go to work in search of belonging. And we've never probably approached it that way for ourselves as individuals, even though that you know, we didn't maybe have the awareness that that's the case. But we spend 40, maybe 50 hours a week or more at work. And so if we're going to do anything for that amount of time, it sure as heck better fill our cup with more than a paycheck. Welcome to the Improvement Nerds podcast, where it's our goal to bring together a bunch of improvement nerds in order to start and improve evolution by providing people with a new tool set, a new skill set, and a new mindset. We're grateful that you're spending time with us today. If you enjoy what you hear, please follow our podcast and subscribe because there's sure to be good content that occurs in these conversations as we nerd out. Hey, Improvement Nerds, this is Tom. I'm so excited to be sharing this episode with you. My guest, Katie Rasul, comes on and shares an amazing story and challenges organizations to do more than what they're currently doing. She says that the most forward-thinking organizations seek to give their employees a sense of belonging so that they have a greater role and more than a job, so that what they're doing day in and day out isn't about a paycheck, but is about a greater purpose. Like if there's one thing a leader can do, and I've seen done well um, in some of my own experiences, is creating a safety. As humans, we are scan our environment kind of subconsciously all the time. We're looking for these cues. We're looking for cues of belonging, of safety, of all of these aspects. And so they have to be consistent. It's these small moments that have to be consistent over the course of time that give us a sense of belonging and give us a sense of safety at work. And so if you say you're going to do something, but then don't, or that's a data point against the sense of belonging. I'm sure that you could tell from these sound bites that Katie is truly passionate about helping organizations to rise to the challenge of giving people purposeful work and giving them a sense of belonging so that they can be them best selves. I spent most of this episode with chills on my arms. Everything she said was so true and absolutely necessary. She is asking for a movement and she's looking for stand up and forward thinking organizations to lead us to a better place in which individuals don't just go to work, but belong at work. Hey, Improvement Nerds, this is Tom West back with another episode of the Improvement Nerds podcast. Today, I've got a special guest, someone that was introduced to me through one of my friends, Brian Turk. Um, Brian and I worked uh, in the HR space helping to deploy technology to allow uh, individuals in the HR space to innovate and to uh, look at their processes in different ways in order to better serve their customers, which oftentimes are the employees. So as he and I compared notes and shared our passions, he reached out and he said, you don't know this person and you need to, Tom, you need to connect with Katie. She's a bright mind. She does a lot of public speaking. She's authored a book about the HR space. Um, And she focuses in on leadership, and she's one of the individuals that comes to mind when I think about how HR is going to look different in the future. So he connected the two of us, and you know, when someone introduces a person in that way, you're like, okay, they're overselling this individual. No one can be that awesome. And then you meet them, and you're like, oh my gosh, what a you know, a ray of sunshine. (laughs) Like all those things are true. And uh, Katie is a bright mind, and she's got a great vision for how HR can, you know, continue to add value now and into the future. So today I welcome Katie to the episode and excited to have her. So welcome, Katie. Thank you so much for having me. I'm excited to be here. Yes, I'm so glad that Brian connected the two of us and that we have the chance to connect on this episode and to get your thoughts and your passion Um, at least showcased on this episode. I know you are putting your message out into the universe already through a lot of different activities. So excited that you've come on to my show and that you're sharing your vision and your ideas with us today. So before we get to you know those things, I want my audience to get to know you a little bit. So tell us a little bit about you. 
Sure. So I um, own my own company, run my own business, and I do leadership coaching. I do advisory and culture work with organizations, and I do keynote speaking. And my company is called Team Awesome, and uh, that's based off of the overuse of the word awesome. It's hard not to say it once (laughs) you say Team Awesome. And uh, I do a lot of that work where I'm really just interested in in helping people find their place, find their leadership in the world. I love working directly with leaders because I think that's the biggest lever that we have in our organizations to incite change. And um, I work with those people individually or within the organizations that hire me for culture work. Great. So that's where you're at now. And that's the service you offer through your business. How did you get there. So talk a little bit about your pathway. A lot of the nerds that I bring on to this show, their pathways to get to where they are, they're they're not like a straight line. I think a lot of individuals assume that these business owners or these thought leaders knew it all along, like they had it figured out and it was a straight line to get where they're at versus most of the time says people share their realities. It's quite the opposite how they got to where they're at like it wasn't planned and sometimes it was a happy mistake so I'm curious what what's been your pathway to get to where you're at today yeah it's all you know they're all the moves were adjacent if you will um but I would have never guessed I would have ended up here uh, I remember being in undergraduate in college, I was a finance major and I was expecting to be like flying on jets and wearing lots of suits and doing international finance. And I never did any of that. Um, I most recently before starting my own business was a HR executive in a company and have always loved the HR space once I was in the workforce because I just loved the like employee experience. Um, I actually started my career working at Target and have sort of accidentally been in retail ever since. And so, um, you know, worked in the stores at Target, which is a best in class organization from a a culture and HR perspective. It certainly was at least when I was there and then did some HR leadership roles at a regional grocery company. And um, since then, I've worked in a lot of different industries as a consultant or as an advisor is kind of a third party, but um, the the retail was sort of this accidental stumble into this very fast paced and exciting world where the employee base is very diverse and different ages and backgrounds and um, positions. So it's been a really fun ride. And I uh, would have never guessed you know, that I'd be here at this moment as a keynote speaker or really focusing on culture and leadership. But all of those things have really landed me in this place, even though they didn't seem that um, that similar to begin with. Yeah. And your experiences with Target, I'm sure... Uh, instilled in you a lot of skills and new thinking um, and kind of got this flywheel going in some ways. So, you know, I have a background in finance also, and I was very number savvy and um, still am very analytical. Um, But as I moved out of school and into the professional world, um, I had to let go of a lot of the things that I learned in the book and in my coursework because reality was very different. So I moved um, from school uh, through nonprofit and then into healthcare. And a lot of people, when they talk about healthcare, they're like, oh yeah, I grew up in healthcare. For me, I grew up because of healthcare. So there were so many bad habits I had because of my schooling that I, I, they were blind spots. I had no idea that I was so far off the mark in regards to leading others because I was just following what the finance uh, tool set was, was what does the data say, project that data forward, validate your assumptions, and take calculated next steps. And I never really had a process to evaluate human behavior or culture has things that influence that. So I came into the workplace and 
a lot of people were using this saying of uh, strategy is important, but culture will eat strategy for breakfast. So, you know, that changed my mindset about what being an effective leader was because all I was about was strategy, strategy, strategy. Here's the plan. Here's what the data says. Here's where we got to go. And I started to really understand the importance of culture because of the, the, the organization that was raising me and, and grooming me to be a different leader than what my education prepared me to be. So going into Target, did you experience a little bit of that shift? It was, it was interesting because I, um, I, when I started at Target, I was in HR roles, which was not what my schooling was. Um, so I think that that was helpful in the sense that I came in with a beginner's mindset and was just learning what it meant to build culture within the organization where before I was looking at financial instruments and this was all still really helpful. Like I ran profit and loss statements and ran large budgets and things like that in my different work experience so that, you know, it wasn't a lost cause. But when I went into Target, I went in like, this is a new topic. Let me learn about this versus really applying anything that I had learned in college. So it was this beginner's mindset. It was just really learning from the ground up and having a moment to be able to say like, what do I think about this? Like, this is how, how the company does it. What is the right thing to do? Luckily I was in an organization that did things right, that did things really well. So I learned what good looked like and could then apply that to different organizations that I went to after the fact, where I felt in some cases that I was from the future. Like I learned some really good best practices working at Target. I can't really say enough good things about working there. And then could then apply them to organizations that were further behind the curve in the culture and leadership space. So it was nice to have that opportunity to learn well. And I didn't have to break any bad habits because I happened to stumble into a really quality organization for that topic to learn from. I um, love the the journey that you've had. And I'm curious, this is true for me. So I'm probably making an assumption here and I'm going out on a limb that maybe when you were at Target, because you were immersed in it, um, you were challenged in, a, in being able to step back from it and realize like how good they actually were. Because in, in where I was, the organization I was a part of was very forward thinking. And one of the things that um, made them special was their commitment to corporate social responsibility. They did a lot of community service and focused on public health. And because I knew nothing different when I was in that organization, I kind of took those things for granted And then I started to go out and see other organizations and realize that where I was was pretty forward thinking. And some of these other organizations, they didn't even know that that was important to be focusing on. So while you were at Target, did, did you realize how special it was or was that something you realized after you left Target and started to work with other organizations and realized those other organizations, um, didn't have those things in place and could have benefited had they. So how, how was it for you? I think that I first realized how good I had it or the the quality of what I had learned in my career, especially around leadership um, when I was doing my MBA and I was taking different classes. Some of them were right. Like financial forecasting or international trade, blah, blah, blah. And then some of them were around leadership or topics that I knew a lot about. And when I took those classes, I learned very little new from the curriculum, but my classmates in, in hearing their experiences that they didn't have the experience that I had in leadership Um, Or these were kind of best practices laid out that I was like, oh, we're doing all of those things and more. So it was really affirming to see that in my MBA classes that I was doing all of the right things and had learned it really young. I was really lucky. It was in my late, you know, like my mid late twenties and felt really 
good about the education I had learned at that point about leadership. And then when I left Target and went and worked in other organizations and, and I knew that they weren't going to be as forward thinking as Target, but I would see things like, wow, I've only ever read about this in books. <laughs> like for example, some organizations have the culture where you're kind of expected to be at your desk or in your cubicle until 5 p.m. or people actually pay attention to if you're sitting at your desk, you must be working. And if you're not, you must be goofing off somewhere or you got to stay longer than the boss does. Like I, I did not know that that was a real thing still. And then I saw it and I experienced it and I'm like, no way. I've only ever read about this in books. And so that gave me a greater appreciation for the organization that I was in working at Target. Thank you for, for sharing that and those kind of reflection points that you'd had in your, your path to take note of the journey you were on and to be able to assess it, not just from your own perspectives, but to crosswalk it between what other people were experiencing. I think for the people listening in, I think that's important for organizations and individuals to do is to not just measure their own progress, but to compare their progress with relevant benchmarks, either So talking about your MBA, you were comparing your level of understanding or your um, use of best practices to what other learners understood about those things. So you were in some ways benchmarking, but then beyond each of those people who were in the MBA program, they were representatives of organizations and those organizations didn't have those processes. So now you were able to compare target to whatever organization that MBA student represented. And I think a lot of organizations don't look outside themselves to compare where they are versus like and or relevant benchmarks. So with that, yeah, I agree. I, yeah. So let's, we talked a lot about target. What are some other like super awesome benchmark organizations that you've seen to be doing this stuff really well. So you talked about the employee experience and that's kind of a broad uh, reaching topic. So let's just, I want to hit just a couple of those that like are icons to you. And then I'm going to move us to the juicy question, which is what nerds you out. So let's hear about those icons that you've seen in this space. Yeah, I think that there are, um, you know, any companies, a lot of companies that are at tops of lists of best places to work have some different strengths in their culture. I think the it, what brings those organizations to the forefront is they decide who they are, they put a stake in the ground, and they live into it. And um, like Zappos has always been a long-term cultural icon, I think, for a lot of people, not only around customer service but around interior culture of their organization because like they're very clear on who they are and they live into it. And so I think different organizations have different personalities that they've selected and that they're going to live into, but those are the most successful I feel are the ones that really know who they are and decide on it, put a stake in the ground and then um, stay consistent and true to that. So people and employees really know what to expect about the culture. Yeah, I'm glad you brought up that organization because in healthcare, measuring the patient experience is a relatively new concept and measuring the workforce experience, they're referred to as the caregivers, at least in the organization I grew up in, was anyone who was in the organization working in healthcare, they chose to call them caregivers. So the employee experience and the caregiver experience were like new concepts in in the space. At least um, our organization didn't adopt it or really resource it adequately until like the last six years. So when we started our journey, we looked at organizations like Zappos, which is, they, they were pretty well published, they got great resources out there, But the other one we looked at was the Cleveland Clinic. And so it was in the healthcare space. 
and they do just a wonderful job of storytelling. And one of the things that they say is there's a difference between caring and caring. So the caring in healthcare often, oftentimes is administering uh, the processes or the medicines or the therapies that help people achieve wellness versus the other caring is, is seeing that person as an individual and valuing the relationship um, with that individual and to treat them like an individual instead of just giving them all these processes that help people like them. These process, this, this, this care we're giving is individualized because I care about you as a person versus I'm just following the processes that were given to me. And that was a pretty big wake up call in my career was we could stay connected to the patient and design processes that were standardized and reliable, but also flexible enough to meet that individual's specific needs. So for Zappos is one of those where like, I am thankful that they are putting out all the information they are to encourage other organizations to do it too. And then Cleveland Clinic, like if you go to YouTube and you search some of the Cleveland Clinic videos, like get a box of Kleenexes because they are really raw and so well done that I have to bring them up because they're it was, those were powerful messages for me when I was working in healthcare. And I think it'll inspire individuals and organizations to identify what the personality is that they want to have has a culture and how they want to show up. Love that. Thanks. I will look at that. I think that um, they've probably spent a lot of time deciding like, who are we going to be? How are we going to show up as an organization and then tell the story, which is so, so powerful for people and it's real. Like in this world now where there's just a lot of noise, I think people are really gravitating towards authenticity. Yes. Yeah. So th- thanks for this, this start starting point. Like, I feel like we've built up a lot of tension. You've had a great journey. You've learned a lot. You share your learning um, with, with the organizations you partner with, with the individuals you coach. So I think we've got the stage set. Like I, I'm sure our audience now has a pretty good sense of who you are, but we haven't hit what nerds you out yet. And that's why I bought you on the show is we, we got to talk about that. So what nerds you out, Katie? Yeah, I, a lot of things. I'm sort of a nerdy in a lot of ways, but from a work perspective, especially, I love to research and talk about the topic of belonging, specifically at work. And everything that I do, all of the work that I do really is built around the big why of spreading love and understanding and belonging. And I think that's all we we really want and need as humans is that we want to feel love. We want to feel like we're understood and we want to belong. And when we put that in the work context, I think that gets really, really interesting because those are not, that's not how we talk about work. That's not how we, a lot of times we approach it. Um, and certainly as we just talked about organizations deciding who they are and putting that stake in the ground, um, that's usually not what probably comes to mind for a lot of organizations is this idea of love, understanding, and belonging. And so whether it's coaching, really anything I do, I think is is centered around that. I love to read. I love to um, take in a lot of information. So I do a lot of that specifically around the topic of belonging at work. I think that's such an interesting topic to focus on and nerd out about because yes, it's really important, but it's also pretty rare. A lot, at least from my experience, a lot of organizations are of the mindset that that's um, a blurry line to be crossing with the people they employ where you're using those words of love or family you know, in some ways, organizations are, well, well, we can't, we can't say things like that, or that's not our responsibility is to, to give individuals that, that home or that sense of belonging through their work. Our, our role is to give them the skills so that they could effectively execute the responsibilities of their job. And that's what 
our relationship should look like. But I think forward-thinking organizations are broadening that definition to say, no, these individuals we employ, it's our responsibility to do much more than just give them a job. It is to give them a sense of belonging and to give them purpose and uh, to treat them with compassion and to invest in them. And I, I, I'm trying to think of a quote um, I don't know where to source it, but it's a story about a, a CEO and a CFO talking about training up a workforce and investing in the workforce. And in the story that one of the two parties, um, the, the CFO, I think, says, what if we invest all this in these people, all this time, energy and resources in them, and they end up leaving us? So the CFO is kind of thinking from a fiduciary mindset. We've got resources, we've got to be good stewards of them, and if we invest them in these people and these people take these things away from us, um, you know, we're not going to get the return on investment. So that's me, basically. That's my entire uh, training and education as I, I perceived the world in that way. And the CEO says, well, what, what if we don't invest in these people and they stay? And that's for a lot of organizations, the, that plays out is they only see the CFO's perspective versus the that's the business case. Oftentimes the CFO thinking about it from numbers and uh, payback period or return on investment, that's the business case. The CEO's perspective of this is the human case. So these are people and we need to treat them like people so that they're the people that depend on us for our services or our goods that they're going to get the benefit of that because our employees are so passionate about what they're doing, they're passing that passion on to our customers. So I think when you're talking about belonging, it's so important, but I I think it's also pretty rare. Are you seeing an uptick in it? Like, what are organizations getting on board with this? Yeah, I think they're starting to, there, there's a turn. And I think there's a few causes that I see of that. First is like, we've been fighting the shortage on talent for a long time. And it was only getting harder for a while there. You know, unemployment was very low. We're, we're in the middle of a situation where that's not the case at the moment because of um, people being out of work because of pandemic. But um up until that point, like it was very hard to find and keep your talented people. And so I think organizations were starting to see like, we need to do some, something differently. And then you think about AI or automation, like there's all this stuff that can be done by computers or by machines in some way. And like the organizations of the future, the hum our humanity is going to be the competitive advantage. And I think organizations are starting to see where they've missed the boat because they're not getting to the goals and the outcomes that they hope to. I talk about belonging a lot too when I'm speaking um, around diversity and inclusion as well. Like that's something that companies have finally gotten on board with for the most part where we talk about diversity and inclusion or maybe take some intentional steps in that space but we're not getting to the outcome that we hope to out of that work. And that outcome that we really want is belonging. And we've not looked at it through that lens in the past. And so I think organizations, especially that are putting time and money and a lot of energy around things like diversity and inclusion, and they're not getting what they want out of that, those, that work, that belonging is sort of that missing link for them. And so I see more and more organizations that are forward thinking that get on board. There are plenty that are not. Let me tell you, I mean, sometimes people will say, oh, I have an organization that you should work with. And they are like, oh, we don't have a culture problem. And I was like, well, I can't help you because if you, if I, I can't be the one to convince you. Organizations that are doing a lot around culture or belonging or want to do something in that space and realize they need to do more, those are the organizations that I work with because um, there's many that that don't get it yet and they are going to be irrelevant in a short period of time because they're not understanding the importance of the people and what they bring to the table. Like the what of our work will not change. That's the same. We're still going to have goals and spreadsheets and all the things, but 
how we achieve those goals, that's where belonging comes in. Like you can still have the goals, but how we achieve them in creating a place that is safe and people feel safe and they can bring their whole selves to work. That's how we achieve those goals. And that's where the belonging piece comes in for me. Thank you for bringing that into the, the, the scope of this conversation. So I've had an episode with Julie Kratz talking about diversity and inclusion and she made the human case for it and was talking about how the workforce now is, yes, very diverse, um, but the generation after the current uh, incoming generation, so you got the millennials and then the X, they, I think it's Z that is, will be coming in in the next you know, five years or so, that they, they are the most diverse generation yet. And that if organizations want to create a home that is welcoming to those individuals, they need to start now. They need to change the way they look and act and think to represent society so that has that workforce is ready to start to be gainfully employed. They're, they see themselves in these organizations because if they don't see themselves in those organizations, they're going to go elsewhere. They'll, they'll find a home where they feel like they can belong. So she was making the case for you, one, if you don't do this, you're going to struggle has a business. So there's definitely a business case, but she was talking about the human element of it is these are people and they, just like every person before them, want to make an impact and to spend their time and energy in a purposeful way. And if organizations don't provide the outlet to do that, you're stifling who they are and what they're capable of doing as a generation. So she was saying, if we, if we can't figure this out, we're going to not just have business problems, we'll have societal problems because these people who want to have an impact are bottled and they have no outlet to contribute. And that that is very defeating. So she was talking a little bit about that. And I'm glad that that's a focus of yours too, is this is urgent. Like, let's not do it because everyone else is doing it. Let's do it because uh, we want to be a thought leader in this and we want to provide that environment where people can come and belong not just for the people who are here now but for the people who are going to come next yeah exactly i think i believe that we go to work in search of belonging and we've never probably approached it that way for ourselves as individuals even though that you know we didn't maybe have the awareness that that's the case but we spend 40 maybe 50 hours a week or more at work. And so if we're going to do anything for that amount of time, it sure as heck better fill our cup with more than a paycheck. And I think that from the organizational standpoint, we have an opportunity is that if we go to work in search of belonging, all the people that work for us come to work hoping to belong to our organization, not just get a paycheck, not just get skills or all the things that we claim we're responsible for like what if organizations owned their responsibility to create workplaces that enhance our lives and that give us those outlets and where we feel like we belong what would that look like for society for our organization I think that there's just a ton of opportunity and possibility there and that's the lens that I ask people to look through about like what could it be in our organizations and how do we live into that versus trying to stay stuck in the way we've done it before, because we're changing generations are changing. Gen Z is coming into the workforce, as you mentioned, and starting with millennials, especially we get it. Now we realize that we can expect good leadership and that we can expect inclusive companies and we're willing to leave to find it. So like the gig, the jig is up, we get it, and we're going to go find what we need at, in companies that can give us the sense of belonging and can give us these things that we're looking for because it's, there's a lot of places offering it, and it needs to be the lens that we start to look through what's possible. Or they're going to go and create it. So the entrepreneurs 
of that generation, if they can't find it, they're resourceful individuals. So they're going to create companies that represent those values. And those companies can grow, um, gain market share, and compete with the current market leader. So if you, you know, one way, if you want to prevent competitors from entering your space, you want to be the first to market around culture because maybe right now you may not, may not perceive there's a threat. But if you don't do these things, a new threat can arise through entrepreneurs saying, I couldn't find this anywhere and I wanted it so much for myself. And I know people who wanted it too, that I created it. And that's you know probably good in some ways. Um, but I think it's something organizations need to be aware of is um, if they don't start to invest in these things, they're not responding to a very loud and well-voiced demand and expectation that we want leadership, we want diversity, we want inclusion, and we're not seeing it anywhere. So we're asking, please create it. But if you don't create it, just know we will. Yes. Oh my gosh. So much yes to that. It's it's true. I think that's this hidden competitor, right, for talent <laughs> that companies aren't necessarily understanding exists. We think about they leave, you know, our talent leaving for another company. Well, more than ever, talent and specifically diverse talent, like women of color are the group starting the most companies, I think at the highest rate. Well, like it's because we, you know, parents don't feel welcome at work. They can't bring their whole self or people of color don't feel supported or don't see enough people that, that look and, and have the same experience as them. So we leave <laughs> and create our own businesses. So there's like this hidden competition in there. I think you're, you're right. That's an important way. And people are willing to take the leap. People are willing to make their own improvements and create what they don't see. Yes. So this is then, I got goosebumps just talking to you about this. When you talked about imagine a world in which employers took it upon themselves to create workplaces that enhanced the lives of the people they employ. Like for me, that just saying it again, like I I've, I've, um, get the chills. And part of it is because I'm excited because I want to see that too. So hopefully our listeners, like just hearing that, that's something that they latch on to, to say, this is, this is important. This is something that some organizations are striving to achieve, but probably not enough. So how can I, wherever I am right now, start to plant the seeds to create this thinking so that we can embark on this journey? Because it's going to take time for, for that reality to actually occur. Even the organizations who are way, way out front, they're probably, they will probably admit that they have more work that they want to do. So there's a gap for sure. We as industry and we as a nation, we have some hard work ahead of us to address these opportunities around diversity, inclusion, and belonging. And, you know, individuals like you putting this out in the universe, hopefully, are serving as the catalytic event to get people started now with a sense of urgency. Because if we wait and wait and wait, this divide just gets bigger and bigger and bigger. And closing that gap becomes more and more challenging. And I think the challenge is as big as when they become so big, uh, it's too intimidating to get going. I think right now, it's small enough for us to actually have an impact. But if, if we think, well, it's not big enough to actually do anything yet, though, we're shooting ourselves in the foot. Yeah, definitely. And it does feel like a gargantuan task. And when we feel overwhelmed by that, the tendency is we do nothing because we don't know where to start. And I think if, we, if, we, if every organization did one thing, and improved by 10%, that would be revolutionary. So we don't all have to solve every problem right away. We just have to start where we are. And like I mentioned earlier, leaders, I believe, are the biggest lever that we have that we can pull to create change. And leaders are in a unique place within the organization. They are responsible for the hive, for their, their organization's values, and for 
you know, what the direction that the organization goes. They are responsible for the team that directly reports to them. So whatever business unit that they might be a part of and their direct reports, and then they're responsible for themselves and they have to belong to themselves in order to have the capacity to belong to others. And so they have this unique point as every player in the game. And so I think that's where we start. And we start to look through the lens of belonging as an organization. We have just enough leaders at the top who are willing to do that and to put those glasses on and keep them on and continue the work through the lens of belonging. Even if we don't have that, leaders, wherever they are in the organization, can start where they are and be responsible for themselves and be responsible for the people in the business unit that reports into them because that will be enough to start to change where they are and change the unit around them that will make a difference in people's lives. It will change the way people feel about work. It'll change the dinner table conversations that happen at home and how present people are with their kids and all the things like that will make a difference. And so leaders are the biggest place that we can start and create incremental change. I'm so glad that you have brought up the uh, the the spillover that can happen for good or bad in, in that equation of this is a person who shows up to work they spend a lot of time and energy there and um, oftentimes they spend more time at work and with the people they work with than they do with their own family so in that situation if they're working exhaustively and they don't feel like they're belonging or contributing, that could be um, pretty dire straits, and it can impact that individual's uh, emotional well-being at work, so they're checked out, uh, and then that's probably the best thing, is that they're just checked out, but in the worst-case scenario, they're toxic. Um, But then imagine how that person acts and behaves outside of work and their other responsibilities. So I think that's the other human case of this is if individuals are going to work and they're not gaining from work, they're going home and not doing the work they got to do there. So I am very blessed to have grown up under a leader who I think is amazing. And he'd always said that the most important work you're ever going to do is around your dinner table. In in the community that you live in. He said that I will never take away the energy you have by asking you to do things here that prevent you from doing things you got to do there. So he, he, that's Travis Lozier. He's um, just an amazing person. So that was the way he approached leadership. And his simple way to create that was during your orientation, he printed a welcome letter and on that welcome letter he had four promises that he was going to make to you as your leader and he wanted everyone on the team to sign this piece of paper too and it was these are our commitments to each other that we commit to give you the autonomy to do purposeful work so that you aren't always being told what to do but it's a conversation about where your passions are and we try to put you in places where you're going to feel joy and grow and, and enjoy what the work that's being asked of you, that you have the chance to gain mastery so that you know you can hone a skill or maybe discover a skill you weren't aware of uh, so that you can make an impact. So we want you to see the progress that you're helping to create. So we're going to measure our results. We're going to talk about our goals. We're going we're gonna to see how we're making progress and how we can make more progress. And the last thing is that he wanted you to have fun and to love the people you work with and to see them as family. And that was a simple uh, piece of paper that I think any leader can draft and sign their name on and start to give to the people they lead. That's one small way that they can start this journey is something as simple as that. And there's lots of other ways that that people can get started. So I've shared my example. Do you have a, a real simple way that people, leaders, can start to show up and role model this? What would be your kind of, hey, if you just did this, that can make a huge impact. I gave one example. What's yours? 
Yeah, I think just creating safety for the team, psychological safety is really defined as, you know, that the team understands that the group is safe for interpersonal risk taking. And so, like, if there's one thing a leader can do, and I've seen done well um, in some of my own experiences, is creating a safety by just sharing by example and say not only saying that it's safe to share who we are and to share unpopular opinions or to share hard things, but then do it themselves to show that it is in fact safe to be vulnerable. I had a boss who um, I think one of the most valuable examples I've ever experienced who I was working under when I had my first child and I was navigating being a, a high level driven working now new mom and had a big job to take care of. And I was stressed about that on so many levels. And I was lucky he was someone who had two young girls and got it and shared that vulnerability and showed me it was a safe place to be a parent and to like be okay with that. And I, you know, coming back to work now being a parent, I think it was hard for me to be like, gosh, are people going to judge me for leaving at 4.55 PM because I have daycare pickup or anyone who has kids in daycare realize that they're sick a lot in those first 18 months or so. And I just all the time was home with a kid that was sick for a little bit of time. And so I was like, oh my God, am I going to get fired? And he's like, Katie, it's fine. It's okay. And created this place of safety in that exact moment when I just had a lot of anxiety about being a new parent in a workplace. And so making it safe for people to be who they are, whatever that looks like. I think is the most basic and important thing a leader can do to create that safe space for employees. And it's not just what that leader says and important is important. It is what that, what their behaviors reinforce has been important. So the letter, the welcoming letter where here's our commitment to each other. If it was just a piece of paper that everyone signed, but no one actually followed through on or, we saw carried out in behaviors of the leader or in ourselves, then it didn't do what it was intended to do. So safety isn't just saying that you want to create safety. It is actually role modeling the behaviors consistently that provide safety. And that is. Yeah. Oh my gosh. Absolutely. You have to, you have to do what you say. Otherwise, you know, I think saying and communicating it is really important, but more important is then following through and doing it. Because if you say it and you don't do it, you've completely broken trust and you've completely broken the safety. Now we know like you can't trust what you have to say. So I think that's so, so critical. And it's almost worse if you like ask for feedback and do nothing with it or say you're going to do something and don't do it. It's worse than if you had just never said anything to begin with. And so that's like the risk that we take. Like, well, I'm going to put the stake in the ground, but I'm going to live into it as a leader. This is who I am. This is what's what we bring to the table here. These are my promises to you. But then by golly, you have to live into those. Yeah, I think that is such an important part of this is that this, this future reality we want to see created, it's only going to occur in people willing to role model the behaviors that show that that reality is possible in everyday exchanges and interactions. And I love that you're saying we want to focus on leaders because they're the culture setters in some ways. So the behaviors of the leader are very visible to everyone else in the organization. And if those behaviors are inconsistent with what the personality is that the organization's wanting to create in the form of a culture, you know, if that leader is acting outside of it and people are watching that behavior, one, they're going to kind of um, disbelieve. But 
there may also try to emulate it and create more of the wrong culture. Whereas if the leader's living into it and giving very clear signals and examples of what behavior should look like and, and uh, what the expectations are, then that workforce has an icon to look up to so that they can emulate. So, so much of how we learn as people is through watching and observing others and repeating those things until they become more of a habit for ourselves. So from the time we were kids, you, you were watching your parents or whoever was your caregiver do certain things in your observations it led to your changing of behaviors or the actions you eventually took. And that's how you learned. And that's still in large part how we learn. So organizations may think, oh, we've got this great training program on diversity and inclusion. And this is how we're going to teach people how to do this. Okay, well, one, that's not how people learn entirely. Yeah, it's a s- small part of it, but the retention of that new knowledge is pretty small. Versus observing it and doing it for themselves, the retention of it is much higher, like 70 to 80% retention. So you, yeah, teach and train on it and create the assets that say that that's what you want to do because that's part of the growth path for people to gain a new skill. But if, if you don't do that last piece and role modeling and showing by example so people can replicate it in their own behaviors, you're not, you're not going to get it. Oh, it's so true. And as humans, we are scan our environment kind of subconsciously all the time. We're looking for these cues. We're looking for cues of belonging, of safety, of all of these aspects. And so they have to be consistent. It's these small moments that have to be consistent over the course of time that give us a sense of belonging and give us a sense of safety at work. And so if you say you're going to do something, but then don't, or right, that's a data point against the sense of belonging. And we're constantly scanning and looking for that. And so if, you know, someone talks over you in a meeting or someone blurts out a, re- a reaction instead of responding thoughtfully, then we learn, oh, that's not safe here. And not just the person who shared the idea, but everybody sees that. And so we're all seeing these tiny moments that add up to belonging over the course of time. So we have to do what we say we're going to do. We have to greet people. We have to make eye contact. Small moments consistently over the course of time. And those are the ways that we as leaders can start to make a difference in people's experiences, in people's lives at work. I I love that the tiny moments that matter, so they add up over time. And I think for leaders listening to this, I hope they've experienced that that's totally within their abilities is to do these small things consistently, and that those small things add up to bigger things. So that I think that's great to highlight here is that to create a sense of belonging. First, you have to have it for yourself because if you don't have it you can't give it um and so we got to give it for the individuals and then then they are in the position where they can create it for others and the way that they can go about creating it isn't necessarily moving mountains but it's in small acts that communicate this and create this over time perfectly said exactly So, uh, yes, I've enjoyed our conversation so much. Uh, I've learned every time I have these, like, I learn so much uh, as a person. And I, I, like, write feverish notes, which helps me to create good, um, you know, ways to, to promote this conversation. And so I do it for that reason. But also, like, I'm a student in these sessions. Like I, I love having podcasts because of what I gain from them. So thank you for, for coming on and sharing your story and for helping me and the listeners of this podcast to gain these, these new ideas and a better understanding of this so that we're equipped to actually take this challenge on. So has individuals listened to this and are inspired to be actionable about it. How do those individuals connect with you or gain resources to get going? 
what's the best way to reach out to you and to, to work with you or people like you to get the ball rolling on this? Sure. Well, I'm, you can find me on all the social medias on the interwebs. Um, pretty easy to find at either. It's either Katie Rossoul or team awesome. Um, coaching is one of the two, but my, my two websites are teamawesomecoaching.com or katierasool.com. And, um, just check out some of the work that's out there. I've got a lot of articles on teamawesomecoaching.com and a lot of, I do a lot of writing. Uh, my book is out there in, on Amazon as well. You can search me as an author. And so, um, just would love for you to send a note, um, either through the the website or through social media and uh, let me know what your experience is and how I can, can help or just would love to connect and hear people's stories. Yes. I hope that individuals um, receive this message as a call to action and that they uh, do reach out and do connect with you. And I think through that, or, in, or even if they don't follow up with you, if they find a resource that somehow allows them to create safety for someone else, like we've done our part, like that's the beauty of messengers like you is oftentimes you want it out in the universe, not not for just your personal gain. So I know, yes, that you have a business around this, um, but I know that's not why you're doing this. I know you're putting it out there because you want to see that reality actually occur one selfishly for yourself, but you're a parent. So I'm assuming this, but I'm thinking you're wanting to see that reality created for your kids and their kids and so on and so forth so that you can uh, create something that's enduring and sustaining by sharing these ideas. Oh gosh. Yeah. I just, I would just want to see it come to life in the world and I, I see it in pockets and it's astounding to me with certain leaders with certain organizations and if we can do even just a little bit more of that then the results could be really meaningful and we just we as leaders you know anyone listening just start where you are I know it can be daunting I'm just say like what's possible and what can I do in the place that I'm at and let's start there Awesome. Well, thank you so much for joining us on Improvement Nerds. I've had a blast and I can't wait to share this podcast with the world. Thanks so much for having me. I love chatting with you. Thank you. Thanks for tuning in, Improvement Nerds. I hope you enjoyed this episode as much as I did. And the conversation that I had with Katie, it's something I look back on quite a bit. The only regret I have in producing this episode and sharing it with you all is that I had not had the opportunity to read her amazing book prior to talking to her on her podcast. And now my mission is to get a mini episode with her and to really focus in on that book and let her tell that story. It is a phenomenal read. I'm about halfway through and I'm absolutely in love with it. And I think it's something that needs to be shared with you all. The book is fun. It's witty and just very well written. And to me, when I listened to this episode, when she talked about you have to belong to yourself before you belong to others, through this book, you get to see Katie's journey for how she went about belonging to herself. And it's so uplifting and probably something everyone can relate to. The one thing that really spoke to me was this idea of the internal board of directors. She does such a fun job talking about those inner monologues that people have and allows you to to take inventory of the stories that you're telling yourself every day and get the tools that you need in order to uh, squelch those, those false stories that exist and to really highlight those that are motivating you. So do yourself a huge favor, get on Amazon and look up Katie, buy her book. I know you're going to love it.